Welcome to Catholic Courses. I'm your professor, Dr. Anthony Eslin, and I will be your guide as we accompany the great poet Dante as he and his own guide, Virgil, make their way up the mountain of purgatory. We're now beginning the second canticle of the Divine Comedy, Dante's epic poem of sin and salvation. When we began the Inferno, the first canticle, we found the pilgrim Dante lost in a dark woods. He had wandered from the narrow way that leads to joy. He would have forever been thwarted in the natural human quest for fulfillment. In other words, he would have lost what he calls the good of the intellect, the face-to-face -face vision of God for which we are made. He would have lost that had it not been for the intervention of the blessed Beatrice. She descended to the rim of hell, the limbo where dwell the virtuous pagans, whose only sin was that they did not give God the homage that he is due because they had not been granted the great gift of faith. And there Beatrice begged Virgil, the ancient pagan poet Virgil, to go to Dante's assistance. Virgil was the great poet of ancient Rome. He had celebrated the piety of his hero Aeneas, who had sailed with his fellow refugees from the devastated city of Troy to settle in a new homeland. Dante, too, is on a journey, and he, too, is a refugee from a city, Florence, whence he was driven out in one of that city's common upheavals of partisan politics. And he, too, is searching for a city, not a, a new Florence in some land far away, but the true and only blessed city, the city of God. As he did in the Inferno, then Dante begins the purgatory by referring to a journey. But unlike the Inferno, the purgatory does not begin by describing the dire straits of a lost pilgrim. As we shall see, purgatory is not a pale shadow of hell. It is not low-carbohydrate damnation. Indeed, all the souls in purgatory are blessed. They dwell in a state of grace. They are protected from sin, and they will all enter paradise one day. Therefore, Dante begins this canticle as if it were him, full of mystery and beauty and wonder. Listen to what he says. My little ship of ingenuity now hoists her sails to speed through better waters, leaving behind so pitiless a sea. And I will sing about that second realm, given the human soul to purge its sin and grow worthy to climb to paradise. He is singing. Note that well. But he is not singing by his own unaided power. For the inferno, he had to rack his brains to pen the poetry of death. But now poetry itself is exalted. Ma qui la morta possiere surga, he cries out in Italian. Here, rise to life again. Dead poetry. That summons is exactly right. For this is, in fact, Sunday morning. It is the day of Easter. Every soul we'll encounter on Purgatory Mountain dwells within that day of resurrection, within that Easter. And every soul looks forward to that final purging, when the souls will at last be scrubbed clean so they may too rise. Dante calls upon the holy muses to assist him in his song. And that means more than that he desires inspiration for his craft. He, he wishes to give himself entirely to them. I am yours, he says. Oh, holy muses, I am yours. He is begging for divine vision to see what man on his own cannot see. And so, before he describes the ground where he is standing, and even before he refers to his companion Virgil, he lifts our eyes to the heavens. He says, Dolce color d'oriental zafiro, sweet sapphire of the morning in the east. It's one of the sweetest and most luminous lines that he ever wrote, utterly unlike the harsh rasps or the thunder, or the stony silences of hell. Sweet sapphire of the morning in the east, gathering in the starlit face of heaven, pure from the zenith to the nearest ring, renewed my joy in looking on the skies as soon as I had come from the dead air which had saddened my heart and dimmed my eyes. Venus, the planet of love, shines as the morning star, and there in the southern sky, Dante looks upon, quote, four stars no one has looked on since the first mankind. Four stars. 
Adam and Eve saw these stars, but no one has seen them since then. We'll soon learn why. Meanwhile, an old man, upon whose white hair and honorable countenance those four holy stars on high are shining, an old man approaches the poets, and his is the first voice in purgatory. Who are you who have come up the blind stream to flee the prison of eternity, said he, shaking those venerable plumes. Who was your guide? What lamp has led your feet, escaping from the sea of that deep night, forever blackening the infernal pit? Are the abysses lost so broken? Or has heaven changed and set a new decree that you, the damned, come to my rocky shore? At first, we may think we are confronted by one of the guardians of hell. We remember that Charon, the boatman of the river Acheron, didn't want to ferry Dante across, said to him, hey, hey, as for you there, you the living soul, get away from these others who are dead. Hell, after all, does not want to deliver up its secrets, lest men learn and be converted from their evil ways. But the tone and bearing of this guardian are entirely different. He's measured, he's calm, he's full of dignity and he is obedient to the will of heaven. Virgil does not reply as he replies to Charon. Basically, shut up, Charon. This is willed where power has power to do whatever it wills. He doesn't answer like that. He says, I have not come on my own. Now that's crucial. On our own, apart from the grace of God, we can do nothing to merit salvation on our own. A lady came from heaven, says Virgil. And he then describes the peril that Dante had been in. The heart of Virgil's plea is also the heart of the meaning of purgatory. Favor his coming, then, he cries to the old man. He seeks his freedom. Libertà va cercando. He seeks his freedom. And how dear that is. He who refused his life for it knows well. You know it. For you did not find it bitter to die for liberty in Utica where you sloughed off the garment that will shine so bright on the great day. Now, this is simply astonishing. We learn indirectly, by Virgil's reference, who this grave old gentleman is. He is Cato of Utica, a pagan Roman. When Julius Caesar, in the first century BC, armed his soldiers against the Roman Senate, pitting his army against their army to set himself up as sole ruler of the Roman state. This Cato fought against him. The war had been taken to the provinces of North Africa, and there near the city of Utica, Cato saw that his opposition to Julius Caesar would not succeed. Then Cato took his own life. In other words, this man is a pagan, or was a pagan, to all appearances anyway, and he was a suicide, to all appearances anyway. So what is Cato doing here? Why is he the honored guardian of purgatory? Why is he not down in the inferno with the suicides, or at least with the virtuous pagans? The explanation lies in Cato's motive and in the meaning of purgatory. Dante recalls the words put into the mouth of Cato by the poet Lucan, a historical poet of the first century AD. Cato, in Lucan's poem, says, Would it were possible for me to lay my head down, condemned by the gods of heaven and hell, and take upon myself all punishments? Let my blood redeem the nations, he cries, longing not to enjoy freedom, but to restore freedom to others. And freedom, the liberation of the will from sin, freedom is the aim of purgatory. As Dante sees it then, Cato did not take his life so much as he lay it down. He laid it down to set men free. And thus he became, though he was not aware of it at the moment, conformed to the example of Christ. He became Christ-like. All that Cato needs to hear now is that Virgil and Dante have arrived at purgatory by the intercession of heavenly lady. Go therefore, he says. He advises them to follow the path of the rising sun as they climb the mountain. Go. That is what purgatory is, uh, uh, by the way. Not a hole in the ground, but a steep mountain on the face of the earth, surrounded by the sea and covered by the beautiful sky.